What's up guys and welcome to episode 4 of Bonnet Inku's Rising Sun painting series. Today we're painting the patron selected mini of the month, the Oni of Skulls. As you've probably already noticed, the length of this video is pretty long. That's because this dude took quite a bit of time to paint, thankfully not as long as the Oni of Hate, but still took quite a while. I tried really hard to cut it down to be as short as possible without cutting out any important details, but it still ended up being pretty long, so feel free to watch this at 1.5 or 2 times speed to get through it a little faster. Also, before we get started, I'd just like to point out that I recently acquired some new P3 and Armor Painter paints, which you'll see used in this video, all of which I was able to acquire thanks to the generous support of all my patrons. So thanks again to all of you who have joined the Patreon and made this possible. You guys are the best. Alright, let's get started. To start things off, I mixed together some Flow Improver, distilled water, and some blue-green paint in my airbrush cup, and then applied that to the entire mini. After that, I poured the majority of that paint into a little potion jar and set it aside, and then add some additional flow improver, water, and a couple drops of deep sky blue, mix that up, and then apply it to the model at approximately a 45 degree angle from above to create some subtle highlights. Then once again, I stored the majority of the paint in a little potion jar and set it aside, and then added some flow improver, water, and some marl white to the cup to brighten it up just a little bit further. Then after mixing that all together, I gave it a couple bursts to get the previous color out of the tip, and then applied this to the model by spraying from above, making sure to accentuate all the muscles, including, but not limited to, his flat butt cheeks. Once again, for those of you who don't have an airbrush, these same transitions can be created using a brush in your favorite blending method. For those who are unfamiliar or unexperienced with the different blending methods, we'll be covering multiple of these in the very first episode of Bonnet Inku's Beginner's Guide to Mini Painting, coming to YouTube very soon. After applying those highlights, I once again stored that mix in a little potion jar and set it aside, and then started building up the shadows by adding some of that original blue-green to the pot, plus a little flow improver, distilled water, and coal black to darken things down, and then sprayed this on the underside of all the muscles and in any sections where I thought would create some more intense contrast. Then once again, when I finished with this color, I dumped the remaining paint into a little potion jar and set it aside with all the rest. Here you can see a quick view of all four colors used during airbrushing, so you can get an idea of what they all look like when they are all mixed up. I then took the model over to the table and applied a wash of an equal mix of blue tone, green tone, and wash base, which as you can see, really started to pop out all those little details in his wrinkly skin. Like I mentioned previously, you want to do this all in one go to avoid any tie marks forming as the wash dries. As long as you keep the brush moving and don't stop in the middle, it should all be fine. On this guy, it was kind of nice because you could almost break him up into little sub-assemblies, 
wash the single arm, move on to the next. Wash the top half, then do the bottom half. One thing you'll notice is that at certain times I rinse out the brush and then use that damp brush to wipe the wash away from certain areas that I want to remain brighter. That way, I can keep the highlights bright while also shading those crevices and bringing out those details. After letting that wash completely dry, I began to lighten things back up by dry brushing on some frostbite. The brush I used for this was an e.l.f. eyeliner brush, which is actually a makeup brush that I picked up from my local Walmart for $1. I definitely recommend picking up one of these eyeliner brushes because it works really well, it holds a fair amount of paint, the bristles are soft yet durable, and it's super cheap so you can beat it up and really not feel bad about it, which is awesome because that's exactly what happens with dry brushing. As I did the dry brushing, I focused most of the strokes from top to bottom to catch just the upper part of all the wrinkles and the details of the skin and the lower parts darker to keep that nice contrast. After getting that skin all dry brushed, I thinned some of that frostbite with some water and applied some fine highlights to the wrinkles on the skin where I wanted the highlights to be the strongest. This took a bit of time and patience, but in the end, it was totally worth it. The highlights ended up looking a whole lot smoother and a lot brighter and just popped a lot more, and it definitely helped clean up some of that dustiness that got left behind from all that dry brushing. After getting those highlights popped out, I then darkened down the most recessed areas of the skin by once again applying an equal mix of blue tone, green tone, and wash base, but this time I only applied it to the darkest areas and then two brush blended it into a lighter area to help create a smooth transition between the two. Once those recessed areas were nice and dark, I then grabbed some blue-green and applied some fine highlights on those darker areas of the skin, bringing them up to the edge of those frostbite highlights, and then blending them together at times to create some smooth transitions. I then went back to Frostbite and applied some edge highlights to the face, base coat of the teeth on his face, and the faces on his knees, as well as base coat of his horns.
After that, I created a cool transition on the horns by applying some coal black to the lower half and frostbite to the upper half, and then wet blending them together with a clean, damp brush. I then used a 1 to 1 mix of coal black and frostbite to apply some edge highlights to all the ridges of the horns. I then applied a wash of light tone to all the teeth and then a 1 to 1 mix of blue tone and green tone to the horns in three different layers, each time moving down a ridge on the horns and doing a bit of blending to keep them transitioning between them nice and smooth. I started first covering four ridges, then three, and then finally two. This helped create a nice gradient on the ridges as well as really darken down the lower half of the horns to create some really intense contrast and create some visual interest. After that, I base coated all the hair on his head and arms, as well as the black straps around each of his arms. I then popped out the details of the hair using a dry brush of blue-green followed by some frostbite and then used a 1 to 1 mix of blue tone and green tone in all the recessed areas to create some contrast. However, this made the hair end up looking too blue and made it blend in with his body too much. So I completely scrapped it and redid it later so we're just going to fast forward this and we'll cover it again later when I do it in what we like to call the right way. After that, I base coated the sheath, gold pieces, armor plates, tiger belt, and nails using bloodstone.
I then bass coated the tiger pelt and waistband using a 1 to 4 mix of Cotter Red Bass and Cygnus Yellow. I then washed down all that orange with a 2 to 1 mix of mid-brown and wash base. I chose to use mid-brown because it had a slight reddish tint to it, which when applied to the orange, gave it a nice subtle shade. Once that wash had fully dried, I used a 1 to 5 mix of Cotter Red Bass and Cygnus Yellow to reestablish the mid tone on the waistband and then dry brush over the tiger pelt to start popping out all the details. I then followed that up with a dry brush of Cygnus Yellow on the pelt, as well as some of the edges of the waistband, then took a fine detail brush and applied some further highlights to the edges to help pop them out. After that, I used some Marl White to paint a little oval in the center of the pelt, and then washed that down with a 1-2 to two mix of Dark Tone and Wash Base, which was just dark enough to help bring out some of those details. Once that wash had dried, I then took some marl white and dry brushed it over the white area and somewhat over into the orange section to create some transition, which ends up looking a little muddy and gross, but that's okay. Sometimes part of the painting process is making your dude look butt ugly so you can make him look awesome later. After that, I did a quick dry brush of some 1 to 5 mix of Cotter Red Base and Cygnus Yellow, followed by a 1 to 4 mix of those same colors to further blend things together. Yeah. 
I then went back to Marl White and used a fine detail brush to emphasize some of the fur bits and help the transition between the white and the orange. Then to finish off that tiger pelt, I added on some stripes by using some burnt umber. To do this, I simply ran the brush from top to bottom, creating little streaks, getting smaller and smaller as I got closer to the center. I also used this to base coat the loincloth that was right next to it, as well as the chainmail protecting his nuts. Because we all know, that's the only reason they have chainmail down there. I also used this color to base coat the emblem in the center of the pelt. After that, I used Thamar Black to pick out the ropes around his waist, and then took a 2 to 1 mix of Thamar Black and Marl White, and used that to pick out all the little edges on the black ropes. I then moved on to the sheath by two brush blending on some one to one mix of bloodstone and cygnus yellow on the bottom half followed by a blending of bloodstone on the upper half to get a nice smooth transition. I then applied burnt umber to the top and bottom of the sheath and blended it together on the end to create a nice transition. Then to finish off the main part of the sheath, I applied some edge highlights using a 1 to 1 mix of Bloodstone and Cygnus Yellow. After that, I used Cotter Red Base to base coat all the inner sections of the armor plates, the ropes around the sheath, and the sword handle.
I then washed down all that red with a 3 to 1 mix of red tone and dark tone. Then when that wash had dried, I picked out the slits on every other strand using some bloody red. If I were to do this again, I would probably wash the red with just dark tone to get a more intense contrast between the recesses and the highlights. With the red strands now complete, I base coated the other strands using Thamar Black, followed by a highlight of a 4 to 1 mix of Thamar Black and Mara White. I then picked out all the gold areas including the emblems, chainmail, armor plates, sword handle, armbands, and headwear using solid gold. One thing I want to mention about this gold is that it doesn't require very much water to thin it and when it's wet it looks like it has terrible coverage. But as it dries it somehow actually ends up having really decent coverage so just keep that in mind as you give this paint a try. It's actually one of my favorite golds to use now and I would highly recommend picking this one up. I then of course washed down all that gold with a smoky ink wash. Like I've mentioned before, I absolutely love this wash. It just shades the gold really well and makes it look kind of weathered and rustic and I just really like how it turns out. Once that wash had fully dried, I then started to apply some highlights using some solid gold, applying it to the upper and end parts of all the gold pieces, and blending it together at times with that layer beneath using a damp brush.
I then further enhanced those highlights by blending on a one-to-one -one mix of solid gold and radiant platinum, followed by some straight radiant platinum. When applying these highlights, I apply each of them to a small subset of the previous highlight, blending it in with a damp brush to keep the transitions nice and smooth. After finishing up all that gold, I wrapped up the sword by applying some cold steel to the blade as well as the collar, followed by a couple washes of dark tone, which I particularly focused on the bottom half to create some nice contrast, and then finished it off by applying some highlights using Radiant Platinum. I then base coat the eyes and the necklace using marl white and then use some jack bone to base coat the bones. After that, I washed down the bones and the necklace using Armor Painter Soft Tone. Now normally I don't do bones this way, but I wanted to try something new this time around. I don't think I like this method as well as my normal one, but that's not to say that this method didn't work well. I just like the look that I get from the other way, which I'll demonstrate towards the end of the video when I show how I painted the skulls on its custom base. Next I picked out all the little ropes around the emblems and the bones using Cottle Red Base and then highlighted the bones using Jack Bone, followed by a more intense highlight of a 1 to 1 mix of Jack Bone and Mara White.
After that, I applied Cygnus Yellow to all three eyes on his head, as well as each of the eyes on his knees, and then gave each eye a little pupil using a super fine micron pen. Which, I definitely recommend picking up a set of these, because creating pupils with these is way easier than doing it with a brush. I'll put a link to them in the description below. At this point, I decided to redo the hair, since when I originally painted it, I'd used the exact same blue colors as the skin. So it ended up blending in way too much, and there just wasn't enough contrast for my liking. So I started this fixing process by dry brushing on some marl white over all the hair to pick out all the raised areas. I then washed down all the hair using Army Painter's Dark Tone then after that initial wash had dried, I applied multiple layers of this wash to some of the more recessed areas to start creating some really dark areas and provide some variation and contrast. To help avoid any tire marks from forming, I blended in the edges of each application using a damp brush. After creating all those really dark areas, I popped out the more raised areas of the hair by dry brushing on some Marl White. I then finished off the hair by applying some Army Painter Blue Tone to the center of all the darkest areas, blending them together slightly into the highlights to create a subtle blue tint. This helped tie the hair in with the rest of the body without completely matching it like it did before. After that, I base coated the loincloth in the middle using a 1-2 mix of Cotter Red Base and Magenta. I then applied Caribou Crimson to all the cloth, followed by some subsequent coats of that same shade in the very recessed areas, being sure to let it dry completely between coats. I don't really like sitting there waiting for it to dry, so I spray air on it with the airbrush to speed up the drying process between coats. Alternatively, you could also use a hair dryer, or you could put it in front of like a small fan or something. I then blended on some highlights using a 1-2 mix of Cotter Red Base and Magenta, followed by some blending of a 1-4 mix of those same colors.
I then finished off the brown cloth by blending on some bloodstone, followed by a one to one mix of bloodstone and jackbone. Then for the final loincloth, I gave it a base coat of a 1 to 1 mix of mutation green and necrotite green, followed by a couple shades of biotan green, just like was done with the caribou crimson on the one above. Then for the initial highlights on the cloth, I once again used the 1 to 1 mix of mutation green and necrotite green, blending it on with some 2 brush blending. Then to further increase that highlight, I mixed together some necrotite green and wash base in a 1 to 3 ratio to create a nice glaze and then applied that in multiple thin layers, stroking the brush from top to bottom until a nice bright highlight was achieved. I then give that cloth its final pop by applying some edge highlights using Necrotite Green. I then base coat the leg wraps using jackbone, the fur using burnt umber, and the straps using bloodstone.
After getting all those areas base coated, I gave them all a wash of Army Painter Strong Tone. After that, I highlighted the fur using some bloodstone, followed by a 112 mix of bloodstone and jackbone, and then did a little bit of highlighting on the main part of the leg wraps using some jackbone. Then as the last step before moving on to the base, I glazed on a 112 mix of Bloodstone and Jackbone onto all his toenails. With the owning not complete, I started creating his custom base. The first thing to do was of course, add a bunch of skulls. Because this is the owning of skulls after all, and it's kinda lame that Simon decided to only give this dude a single skull on his necklace. So I remedied this by adding a couple piles of skulls to the base. To do this, I pulled out some epoxy sculpt and grabbed equal amounts from each, and then blended the two parts together by mashing them together until a uniform color was achieved, and then took a chunk of it and created a small mound on the front of the base. After getting that mound adhered to the base, I pulled out my box of skulls and started pressing in a variety of skulls into the mound, including a bunch of small human skulls as well as one large one, which looked like it could belong to another Oni. I then repeated this process to make a smaller mound right behind him. I then pulled out a couple boxes of rocks and dug around in each of them to find a couple little stones for the base and then played around with the placement of those rocks until I found an arrangement that I thought looked good.
I then pulled out my brown earth texture paint and applied it to the base with various tools, pushing the paint up in between all the skulls and underneath his feet with the tip of the brush, cleaning things up as necessary with a wet brush and q-tips. I then press the rocks into the texture paint as well as some extra skulls for added variation. Once that texture paint had fully dried, I used some Vallejo polyurethane black primer to prime the rocks and the skulls and then gave them all a couple highlights by dry brushing on a 1 to 1 mix of Thamar black and Marl white, followed by a 1 to 3 mix, and finally straight Marl white. I then washed on all the rocks using a 1 to 1 mix of dark tone and wash base, followed by some final highlights using Marl White. After that, I base coat all the skulls using Jackbone. After base coating all those skulls, I gave them a heavy wash of smoky ink and washed down the dirt using Army Painter's Strong Tone. After those washes had fully dried, I applied a couple layers of highlights to the skulls, first with Jackbone, 
then a 1 to 1 mix of Jackbone and Mara White, and finally a 1 to 3 mix of Jackbone and Mara White, focusing each highlight on a smaller section of the skulls, particularly the faces and edges. I then finished up the skulls by giving them a light wash of a 1 to 2 mix of light tone and wash base to smooth things out and to tie all the highlights and shades together. I then highlighted all the dirt by applying a dry brush of ochre brown and then a 1 to 1 mix of ochre brown and marl white. Then to finish things all off, I added some bushes and painted the trim black. And there you have it, the Oni of Skulls is now complete. Thank you guys for joining, hope you enjoyed the tutorial and found it helpful in painting your own Oni of Skulls. This guy was a ton of fun to paint, he took about 29 hours to paint, though a lot of you guys will probably be able to paint him a lot faster than I did, because of course, I'm kind of slow, and I'm kind of particular, but you know, that's just how it goes. Thanks again to all my patrons, particularly those that voted on this model for the month of June. He was a ton of fun, and I really enjoyed painting him up. Be sure to like, subscribe, and check out our Patreon, Facebook, and Instagram pages for extra Bondi and Koo goodness. See you guys on the next one. On your skulls. Complete. Bondaroo. Out. Well, there's your problem. Gary's been running his Honan transfer equations to include gravitational effects varying as the inverse cube of the distance. I'm a decorated astronaut. I don't make those kind of mistakes. Well, then now wait a minute. Look, I'll show you. I'll enter the same calculations using what we like to call the right way. Then I'll open the lander file and I'll initiate the Mars landing sequence. I've seen enough.